Hi, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan, and I have been focused on COVID since early 2020, looking at the research, especially around autoimmunity, and trying to make sense of the patterns in the pandemic. One of the things that keeps on coming up all the time is this strange circular discussion around ivermectin. Now, let it be clear, I am not one of the groups who is strongly against it, not one of the groups who is strongly for it, but I always look at the science and ask important questions, which is, if it's relevant, certainly it needs to be part of the picture. So the reason I'm talking about it today is because of a paper that has just been published just a few days ago. And this is a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at ivermectin in the treatment for COVID-19. And as usual, it's trying to put a nail in the coffin that they have done for a very long time. But it just seems to never quite go away. I wonder why. Before I start, I'd just like to remind everyone first, remember to subscribe. Additionally, if you're interested in courses, if you're interested in joining on Substack, please click on the links below. They're right at the bottom. And we're always happy to have you involved in this journey of science and research. So let's get back to the story in hand. This is tied into a presentation that I had in my pocket for about two years now, and I never thought that I would actually ever need to present it. And it's around an image that I had put together a long time ago. And this is the case of Uttar Pradesh in India. And I'll take you through this image in a short while after I go through some basic information about what has recently been said. So this paper has come out on the 11th of March, 2024, and it's again talking about ivermectin for treatment of COVID-19, systematic review and meta-analysis. And essentially what they were saying here, the effect of ivermectin in treating coronavirus disease is still controversial. And so what they were trying to do was trying to see if they can clarify some of the controversy. So they looked at it from a number of studies. So what they were doing is they were putting together a number of studies across the world that had been done, looking at if there was anything significant. Parts of their conclusion were here. And as they said here, based on their conclusion, they found no significant difference in all cause mortality rates or PCR negative conversion between ivermectin and controls. However, there were significant differences in mechanical ventilation requirement and adverse events between the two groups. Ivermectin could reduce the risk of mechanical ventilation requirements and adverse events in patients with COVID-19 without increasing other risks. So this is not so much a nail in the coffin. This in some way is actually quite supportive of ivermectin, which is a remarkably safe drug. So just to be clear, I can't take any credit for being one of the people who was pushing this along, because I myself at the beginning when I heard about it was very skeptical. I was saying, well, why would that work? It's an antiparasitic drug. What's the relevance in the context of COVID-19? So what then happened is that because I have a scientific mind, my point is first observation. If people are saying it's working, and there does seem to be some benefit. Well, why would I not try and see, well, what could be the mechanism? That's really my question. Because if it does work, are there other things that could work with it? That's really the science. And so once I recognize that the drug has immune modulating effects, because of my research around autoimmunity, I thought, yep, it's no doubt that it could probably have an effect. But my view at the time was certainly that steroids where certainly an high-dose steroids would be the mainstay in terms of treating severe COVID-19. But I did continue to follow this with interest. Now, I'm going to share with you an important piece of information, and this is part of what convinced me that you can't ignore the observation. You just have to observe and reflect. So I'll take you through this step. And as I said, I put this image together about two years ago. This is a case of Uttar Pradesh in India. 
And we're looking at a timeline here. So this is in 2020. This is January 2021. And this is January 2022. Okay, follow the timeline. So this is the alpha, the, the Wuhan alpha um, wave where they had deaths that were occurring. And then it went down to about this point. And at this point, it seems that India was about 44.3% fully vaccinated at that point. So this is now moving down into 2021. And at that time, Uttar Pradesh had a low vaccination rate, one of the lowest at the time. So up to September here, they're only 20% vaccinated compared to 44.3% across India. And then you remember that huge surge of Delta that occurred in India, and deaths were rising very, very rapidly. This was the Delta wave. But then what seemed to happen is that it peaked and came down very steeply, almost to zero. What was then even stranger was that even though they were at baseline here again, at 20% vaccination here, within about five months or four months, they were 92% vaccinated, that region. It was remarkable. It was almost as if they were saying, heck, whatever they did here, we need to buy into the benefit of it. And so therefore this was started here to say, well, this must be part of the reason. The truth is, whatever happened here must have been the most critical and relevant point. I'll take you through that in just a second. But that was the timeline of what happened. And you can go and look at the statistics to see whether or not that is so. I then found another paper, and this was published in 2022, uh, in March 2022. So this was just after. And they were looking at the management of mild to moderate COVID during the second wave in India, a non-evidence-based approach. So they were looking at the fact that people just did it. They didn't have necessarily all the necessary evidence. They just did what they had to do because, yep, yeah, they were in a pandemic. People were dying. They needed to do something quickly. And so that's what happened in India. And I'm going to show you then what they did in that region of uh, Uttar Pradesh, because in different parts of India, they did different things. Um, but I'll show you here again. Uh, this here is an image showing the different things that they had done in different regions. In one section, they use this. Uh, this is Zivirdo, which was circulated widely on social media. And that was zinc, doxycycline, and ivermectin in one package. And then they were talking about what happened in terms of Uttar Pradesh. So here is what exactly they did. So this is the breakdown. And this was sent from the Director General, Medical and Health Services, Uttar Pradesh. And they sent this out to all their divisional directors. It was dated here, the 14th of April, 2021. And so they were aware of the rapidly increasing cases. And so they came up with this protocol, or they put it out. They had ivermectin, they had azithromycin, they had doxycycline. They had in it as well elemental zinc, ascorbic acid, and here, 60,000 units of vitamin D once per week for eight weeks. This was their package that they then put out at that time. Remember the date here? Date is the 15th of the 4th, 2021. They were just running into the surge of Delta. And you can see here that they started it effectively just around here. This is the 18th of May, the peak. So they started it on the 15th of April, just around here as it was surging. And look what happened. Now, some critics say that this fall off was irrelevant. This is what would have happened anyway. And so it had nothing to do with the intervention. I'm not so convinced. I'm saying that, listen, this is what I'm saying about observation. If you observe it and you see it occurring, why, why would you ignore it? Why would you say it didn't happen? Why would you say that it was irrelevant? It was a placebo effect or this was just what happened? Well, the truth is that didn't happen anywhere else. This was just something very unique for that region. And it didn't happen in all the other parts of India as well. So why would it have happened in that region if it was not related to what they did? Now, 
for the thinkers here, I'm going to explain something very, very simple, but really important, just around how the disease works. You have to remember the virus spreads very quickly. In the first phases, it's asymptomatic, it spreads to the lungs, spreads to other people. That is the reason why it was so hard to control, because if you waited for symptoms, there are still some people who think that it doesn't spread until you have symptoms. Oh, no, no, no. This is why it spread across the world. It spreads in the asymptomatic phase, and this is why it continues to circulate, because a lot of people are asymptomatic and can't get rid of it. So here is how the virus works. It's a very sophisticated system. This was from a paper from Cell, and uh, this was published in 2023. So I didn't get the answer to this until 2023, but this was so important. And this is showing you the way how the virus enters and exits within 48 hours, six hours, 24 hours, 48 hours. The virus then uses the cilia to go down. And this uh, cream area here is what is mucus. So it can't penetrate the mucus. So it binds to the cilia sticking above, and then it uses them to go down and enter the cell. How does it get out? Because it can't get out through the mucus. So the virus has an ingenious way of making these tiny microvilli here grow into tree-like structures. And then they stick above the mucus, and guess what? That's where the virus can then spread huge amounts, millions of particles from each cell, all through the lungs and to other people. So this mechanism here is absolutely critical to how the virus operates. Why am I highlighting it? Because that's exactly where ivermectin has an effect. But Here's an important thing. When they looked at the studies, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, because I have to show you this with regards to the studies. So in one part of the study here, they were looking at all-cause mortality. So they were looking at the difference. They found there was no significant difference in all-cause mortality rate between ivermectin and controls. So I then looked a little bit more closely here. So this is all the studies that they had done. And at the bottom here, it says this side of the line favors ivermectin, this side favors the control. And what you can see here is that this one here is slightly favoring the control. This is right on the midline, but here, favors ivermectin, favors ivermectin, favors ivermectin, favors control, favors control, favors ivermectin. As far as I'm concerned, once you start to see benefits, because if this doesn't work, you should see almost no benefits. It should be literally, unless it's a placebo effect, it should be on the midline and favoring, favoring control. Once you're starting to see shifts, you realize that there must be something that is happening. Maybe it appears not to be significant enough, but they're testing this on its own. And I'm going to come back to why that's so important. So here is another part of the paper that showed, and this time they were looking at mechanical ventilation. So the effect of ivermectin on mechanical ventilation requirements in patients with COVID-19. And this is the image, uh, same image close up. And again, this side of the midline, this is the line down the middle, risk ratio, this favors ivermectin, this favors control. And you can suddenly see here, the majority of these studies found that there was benefit for mechanical ventilation in terms of reducing the risk. Well, you got a problem there because if it reduces mechanical ventilation, that is really what we are after in the context of preventing death. If you don't need to get people on ventilators, there's a much lower risk of them dying. And so even if somebody got sick, but not as severely sick, or if they still got COVID, if you're using your benchmark as whether or not they got COVID, my benchmark is whether or not they ended on a ventilator. So without a doubt, there is something clearly here that is showing benefit. Now, here is the important piece of the information. And this is where a lot of people made mistakes. And uh, the doctor from Honduras that I had spoken to some years ago, Dr. Valiera, he highlighted that people keep on getting confused because they're not realizing you have to use stuff in combination. It's not usually one or the other. When you use them in combination, you really get significant benefit. Here is what they did. And you're looking again carefully at what they did here. Not only did they use this ivermectin, 
which would impact on that tree-like structure the virus uses. But they also gave 60,000 units of vitamin D, one per week for eight weeks. They almost assumed everybody was vitamin D deficient. This is the part that really is quite remarkable. They stumbled into this. And what they wouldn't have known at the time is that the proteins that cause the tree-like structures to grow, PAC-1, is there are two of them, PAC-1 and PAC-4, the PAC-1 is inhibited not just by ivermectin, but also vitamin D. So you have a dual effect of suppressing this characteristic of the virus to spread. So the longer the virus takes to spread, the less likely it is to cause severe disease and the less likely it is to spread to different people in the population. So it doesn't mean people can't get infected. It just slows the rate of infection. Again, look carefully at the image. It needs these microvilli on the surface of the cell to grow into these trees in order for it to, sp to spread. Anything that slows this process is going to impact on the spread and therefore the severity of the disease. It's quite simple. And once you understand the science, there is no question. And so this is what we need now. I, I can't understand where we're at a time now where for all those people who said you need to do this, you need to do that, whatever you had said isn't quite working at this point. We still have high viral circulation. People are still dying. There's excess deaths. They're not dying of severe COVID-19, but they're still dying. We need something to suppress the virus. My question is simple. Why would you discount this? I just don't understand the thinking. It is so safe that even if it doesn't work and it's the placebo effect, then wow, what have you got to lose? That's how I looked at it, and that's how I look at it now. There are very little options at this point. And to try and put a nail in the coffin for what may be one of your valuable um, solution. So it's never on its own. It's with the combination. And this is the point is if you can't get one, you certainly make sure you're using the other. Everybody needs vitamin D. And so therefore make sure your vitamin D levels are up. If there's any point that should be, should be relevant. So just remember, as we say, at the end of the day, learn to observe. That's who I hope my followers are. People who observe, listen, and think about what you're hearing. Never get too drawn one way or the other. Never criticize too much. Just look for solutions and let's see if we can find them together because the world needs solutions now. We need to be thinking. We need not to be arguing and we need to make use of every single angle that we have available to us. Have a great evening.